Good morning, afternoon, evening, middle of the night, whatever time it is for you. Welcome, dim the lights, get the popcorn, and step into this journey that I'm going to take you on into our very near future. In a previous video, I was talking about sea ice vanishing in the first blue ocean event in the Arctic Ocean by September, say 2020. So after that happens, whether it's 2020 or 2017 or 2022 or whatever, after the first Arctic Blue Ocean event, then what? What will happen, okay, to the ice after that? So I'm gonna investigate the options and tell you what I think. I'm Paul Beckwith. I teach, um, usually I teach at, um, in the Department of Geography at Ottawa and most recently at Carleton, but I don't have teaching positions yet. This work I do is all on my own time, um, and I just do it out of my concern for the planet. So if you want to encourage me to keep these videos coming and up the quality and get loads of different topics, then please consider a donation on my website, paulbeckwith.net and suggest videos and I'll try to do it. You can see, you can have an influence on, on the videos I do. Okay, so let's try to answer this question. What will happen? Okay, maybe not. Technical error, oh, I know, okay, there we go. Okay, so here's my view, and if you've watched previous videos that I've done, um, you'll recognize this. I'll call it scenario A. If the overall trend continues with sea ice, there's a high probability that the first blue ocean event occurs by 2020. Ice-free duration would likely be less than a month. Okay, the Arctic Ocean might be clear for a couple weeks or a month. There might be a little bit of ice around the edges, a little bit floating around, but essentially lost by 2020 or earlier. So then what happens? Well, I've said for quite a while, for years in fact, that this is what I think will happen. And I, st I stay with this, but maybe it's wrong. But anyway, let's see. So ice feed duration would be extended to three months. So Instead of the ice just being gone in September for a few weeks or a month in 2020, say, by 2021 or 2022, you'd have no sea ice for August, September, October. And then a few years after that, say by 2023, um, might have ice-free duration for five months. It might be June, July, August, September, October, or it might be an, add another month on two months before and after September. So July, August, September, October, November. So about five months of the year, about half of the year. Now, another scenario is that we stay in that state for a while, but I think we'll have an ice-free duration all year by roughly T plus 10 years, 2030 or so. And I'll explain why I think that in this video. Just one of the huge feedbacks is heat, okay? The, the Arctic's like a refrigerator. As long as there's ice, that heat goes into melting the ice. So the amount of heat that melts a kilogram of ice to zero degrees Celsius, just above freezing, um, to, well, if the ice is just below freezing to just above freezing, it would raise the temperature, take that same energy and put it on water at zero, it would raise that temperature to 80 degrees Celsius, a kilogram of water. This is a huge, huge effect but there's many others. Okay, so first of all, people have pointed out quite rightly that, hey, you know, maybe the ice will stick around in the winter, maybe it'll just go in the summer. So these are the possible scenarios that I can think of. The Arctic Ocean ice-free duration, this is scenario A, which, I'm, which I think is gonna happen. We get more and longer and longer periods of ice-free duration until there's no ice throughout the entire year within a decade or so. I mean, maybe it takes longer than a decade, allowing other feedbacks to build up. Like if it takes some time for methane to come up big time, if it takes time for greenhouse gases to build up um, from cascading feedbacks, et cetera, you know, dwarfing human emissions, you know, and then maybe that would be required. But I think, you know, a decade or so for the sake of argument. 
if the scenario B could happen, it could proceed, things could proceed as in A, except you could reach some sort of quasi steady state where there's an ice cover in the winter, which reforms in the winter, and there's it, the, the Arctic Ocean is ice free in the summer months. So about half the year it's ice free, about half the year it's got a perennial ice cover, which albeit would, albeit would be very thin, you know, wouldn't have, wouldn't be, it would all be first year ice, obviously, um, and, uh, you know, kind of swirl around and, and stuff, but maybe it does reform e each year. Okay, that's scenario B. Scenario C is that, well, it's a mixture of the two. You have the variability so large. Some years there's no ice in the summer, other years um, there is ice in the summer, but, you know, maybe it reaches some steady state so this is similar to B, until the greenhouse gases rise enough for it to completely vanish year round as per A. So the timing, you know, first of all, you know, we have different ideas on the states um, and also the timing from one state to the next, the progression of ice loss over time could vary. Other scenarios, let me know if um, in comments to this YouTube video, if you think of them. Now, the mechanisms for Arctic sea ice loss, I covered this in a previous video. You have melting from above, melting from below, export out of the Arctic Ocean. There's lots of different things that are happening for each of these cases. So, you know, have a look, just, uh, you know, stop the video and read the slide or watch a previous video where I explain this in detail. Uh, mechanisms for sea ice formation, freezing of, onto the ice surface from below, precipitation, falling and bonding, wave action, overriding, bringing water over the ice, which freezes, things like that. Again, I discussed that in a previous video. Okay, so now we get to the nitty gritty of this video. I, like I said, I think scenario A is most likely. As we get more science observations and more modeling, but not so much models, for me anyway, this view will surely change, of course. Okay, so it's the best I can do right now. And um, so here are some of the key points. With no Arctic sea ice after the first blue ocean event, the albedo of the Arctic will drop significantly. Now we've got the entire Arctic Ocean open, it's black, it's dark, it only, it absorbs 90% of the incoming solar radiation as opposed to the ice um, and snow which could reflect you know, 80 or 90 percent. So the seawater absorbs huge amounts of radiation heating up to depth. No longer do we have a cold cap of water existing near the surface. The salinity is it's saltier water because we don't get that more ice melting. So it mixes with the salt water, so it's saltier and heavier. So the deeper North Atlantic derived water mixes with the sun warm surface water, keeps it warm for a longer period of time after the sun sets in the Arctic in the fall. The albedo continues to fall in the Arctic with the reduction of snow cover on the land, especially in the spring, right? And this is actually reducing even faster than the sea ice, and this will continue to, you know, put pressure on the ice not being there. Okay, another point. Wave energy greatly increases in an Arctic in the, with no sea ice, obviously. You get wind going across large bodies of water now with no ice, it whips up the waves. You have a long fetch or long distance of wind blowing across the water, long durations, and you get large waves. These large waves are there in all year round and they inhibit the growth of the sea ice. They break up any ice that's formed into smaller pieces. It has difficulty getting established. Okay, let's move on. The air circulation patterns will reverse in the Arctic, okay? When there's an ice cap over the Arctic Ocean, the world that we're, we're familiar with and we're, we're leaving rapidly, the behavior is like that of a cold continent. You get cold air sitting above the ice. That leads to a high pressure area over the ice. The air moves from high to low pressure. Coriolis pulls it to the right. So we get a clockwise um, gyre. Beaufort gyre drags the ice along and it leads to the transpolar drift. But when the Arctic has no ice, the seawater is much warmer than the land surfaces, especially in the fall. So the air will rise over the ocean, creating a low pressure over the water, and thus the surrounding areas are all cooling quickly in the fall, so that high pressure air is over there. Air moves from high to low pressure, curves to the right with the Coriolis. So we're going to get a air circulation pattern becoming clockwise around the Arctic Ocean instead of counterclockwise. 
This will draw warm surface waters into the Arctic Ocean from the open oceans north of Svalbard. It changes all of the patterns of, of movement, okay? And I think it will work to keep ice out of the basin in the Arctic Ocean in the winters. The Arctic Ocean region has ever increasing amounts of rainfall as it continues to rapidly warm, much less snowfall, even extending into winter. The water sources for many of these storms are from further south as when that air moves up into the Arctic, it brings large amounts of heat up into the Arctic region. With the summer loss of sea ice, the refrigeration effect vanishes. Okay, I mentioned this already. The seawater rapidly heats up in the summer. It gets extremely warm in the summer and it takes a long time to cool down because it's warm and it's mixed by the waves with warm water from below. And then when it starts, you get the radiative heating in the winter in, in a dark Arctic, then there's still mixing of the water and waves and there's an awful lot of heat that has to be removed before the ice can form. Okay, so when the ice is completely vanished in the summer, all of this heat goes into sensible heat, it accelerates the heating of the seawater. Okay, the jet streams, this is a key feedback. They become much slower and wavier, they're doing that now, the ridges go right up into the North Pole. We've already seen this, they bring, that will bring large amounts of heat to the North Pole, even in the complete darkness of winter. Temperature above zero Celsius in the dead of winter in both uh, December and uh, February or March within the last few years. We've seen this already. Jet streams going right to the, to the North Pole. They also go far enough south they cross the equator. That's another topic, another video, and I need to revisit that from last year. This effect, I think, will be strong enough to ensure that the sea ice doesn't reform in northern winters of darkness. The jet streams normally act as a wall or barrier confining cold, dry air to the Arctic, warm, humid air to lower latitudes. Greatly warmed Arctic, these jet streams will be completely fractured, no longer exist as a wall. There's nothing stopping the warm, moist air from lower latitudes carrying latent and sensible heat directly up to the Arct over the Arctic Ocean throughout the entire year. And cold, drier air from the Arctic region can move southward. No jet stream wall or or, or barrier. So both of these types of transport, if you have cold air moving to the Arctic, or if you have warm air, warm moist air moving to the Arctic, that's bringing heat to the Arctic. If you have cold, dry air from the Arctic moving south, that has to be replaced with hotter air that also warms the Arctic. Both effects warm the Arctic. Okay, after the first blue ocean event, ramping up of warming in the Arctic will greatly increase Arctic temperature amplification. Greenland's exposed. Melt rates of Greenland glaciers will accelerate with corresponding acceleration to global sea levels. Rising sea levels will start cause calving and loss of Antarctic glacial ice, and they'll both be shedding ice, and that further raises sea levels, which then will mix into the Arctic, and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it'll cause... It, it, it's, yeah, I think uh, it also adds to no sea ice, um, no sea ice year round. Much warmer oceans in the Arctic will increase evaporation levels. Much warmer air in the Arctic carry much greater amounts of water vapor. You know, remember a 7% increase in water vapor occurs per degree Celsius rise in temperature. That's what the air can hold. This evaporation from the Arctic Ocean water will continue into the fall, so there'll be much thicker and more extensive marine cloud cover layers formed. Okay, these clouds will continue into the winter and they trap uh, long wave radiation, so it won't be able to boot off into space. It'll be trapped, so the Arctic will be warmer, sustaining um, the water instead of ice. Greenhouse gas emissions. We'll add lots of CO2 and methane into the Arctic from terrestrial permafrost. It takes time for these gases to diffuse southward, so they'll greatly increase warming in the region. Now, also, I discussed the Russian observations over the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf recently. There's an ever-increasing amount of thaw of subsea permafrost. Um, so, there, therefore, you know, the permafrost is like a cork on a champagne bottle, so the emissions of methane from clathrates and free gas in the sediments will skyrocket. There's a risk of large methane releases, greatly multiplying the methane. So, we're in a global climate emergency. It's thus far ignored and essentially unrecognized by society. We have to declare an emergency, and then governments all around the world and people and policymakers can respond. And we need to deploy the three-legged bar stool, which I illustrate here. Okay, there's a great book, Drawdown, have a look at it.